the wonderful thing about parenting is that it provides an ample amount of material to inspire sermon ideas. <clears throat> and this is one of those such times. Fortunately uh, for me, raising twin toddlers gives me a daily dose if I'm patient enough to pay attention. So the other morning, I was reflecting on a peculiar and undesirable behavior that uh, one of my twins has, has had recently that I hadn't really picked up on until very recently. Maybe some of you have, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> it became particularly uh, poignant recently. Uh, so you see, we've been, my wife and I, wrestling, uh, I'll say, with training up uh, the willingness to simply listen and obey <laughs> our requests. It's a challenge, uh, especially at that young age when they, um, when children become very uh, much more capable, uh, more independent, but still are learning the, the do's and don'ts of um, what they are instructed to do. So, uh, of course, it takes hard, persistent work to succeed and succeed we will at this, helping our children to uh, listen. Um, and uh, what we found is that certain methods tend to work as we try to help them uh, listen, only to become counterproductive uh, over a period of time. So that means that we've got to stay, up, stay on our toes, continue to be creative with different methods that we use. But uh, I digress. So the behavior that I was picking up on uh, was kind of related to this, this uh, desire to get them to listen to us. Uh, what I noticed is that I, I was starting to get bossed around by one of my twins, uh, and quite rudely. Uh, he was telling me what to do. I was hearing a lot of commands to the effect of, get my water, get me a snack, get my toy, you know the kind of thing I'm talking about. I, I think um, my older children here in the audience are, are laughing. They know what I'm saying. My wife certainly does. So if, for a parent to take orders from a three-year-old is just not cool. It's not right. And I was not going to have any of that. Uh, as we heard in the sermonette, I was standing my ground. <laughs> so here, hearing my, my child uh, bark out commands, was simply something that I uh, could not tolerate. Uh, I don't want to be bossed around, and he is the one that needs to change. Am I right? Can I, can I get an amen? I, I hope so. Now, I don't mind helping my children when they have genuine requests for help. I help them a lot. Um, but it is so much easier for me to help out when they, these requests are made with politeness, you know, maybe asking please, I think, helps. Uh, and I don't want to be commanded around. That, that's, that's just the point. Um, so I, I'm willing to help, but it, it helps to have that polite behavior. And then it dawned on me as I was thinking about it uh, during this week that his behavior exactly reflects my own. You see, when I want uh, my son to do something and he doesn't do it, I make stronger and stronger commands, quite often resulting in some physical persuasion. To no surprise, uh, the commands that I make invoke much the same kind of response that I feel myself when I'm on the receiving end of these commands. And that is resistance, and anger. My son, too, stands his ground and uh, exerts his own will. So I, I realized this problem like, oh, he's barking out commands at me because I'm barking out commands at him. So, so I tried changing my tactic a little bit. Uh, first, I take a deep breath when I want my son to listen. And then I make a request kindly using the word please as often as I can, trying to be uh, calm and uh, succinct and patient. It will probably be no surprise uh, to hear that this simple change really did have 
a, a positive effect. It, I've noticed immediate improvement, uh, which was really very fortunate, uh, immediate improvement with both behaviors, in fact. Uh, I found that he would listen more and that his commands toward me were uh, going down in frequency as well. Not, it's not gone yet. <laughs> the battle is not won. But at least I've uh, I found a, some methods that tend to help. More obedience, more politeness is the result of me just trying to be more patient and kind. Uh, so it has worked for the past few days. It's bound to lose its effectiveness. But for now, there's enough of an improvement to share it with you today. So why am I sharing this with you? Why, what am I bringing this up for? Uh, quite simply, when I realized that I, myself, was a big contributor to the problem, it, it really stung, actually. Uh, I, it was kind of a facepalm moment where I thought that I was doing everything right as a parent, that I was uh, in a good position to be the one who was rightfully making these commands and rightfully... Uh, having these expectations of obedience and that my son was the one who really needed to change exclusively. I felt that I needed not to change at all. But it turns out, once again, that uh, I've exposed a flaw in my own behavior, laying my imperfections bare for at least myself and now you to see uh, that I was trying my best to be a good parent uh, but, and raise obedient children, uh, but yet falling flat. The imperfections, the flaws, the screw-ups, the sins that we all have can be really discouraging. In fact, when I realized that I was part of this problem, I was rolling my eyes at myself, discouraged, but also realizing that I was in enough control to change and the consequences weren't, weren't too great uh, to do so. But failure in doing our own job is just frustrating. Whenever we fail, it's frustrating. As Christians, when we begin living this way of life, we, as a matter of fact, sign up to experience failure over and over and over again. That's what sin is. Sin is a failure to obey God. It is when we fall short of that obedience. It is a failure. But we need to choose what we do with that failure. Just when we are trying to succeed, when we are working our hardest to win, it can be really disheartening to see the report card and see that we're not even close to meeting the mark of perfection. So this sermon is about acknowledging uh, the discouragement that we face in our shortcomings on our spiritual journey. But it's also about the encouragement of the promises that God provides us to help us through those shortcomings. As the title states, this is about the bad news and the good news. The bad news is simply this, that we fail regularly. The good news is that God doesn't count it against us as long as we don't give up our efforts to overcome. So I've split this sermon up into two very simple parts. I'll start with the bad news. Turn with me, if you will, to uh, Luke 18, and I'll begin in verse 9. Luke 18 and verse 9, we read about a parable that was alluded to in the sermonette. <clears throat> also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We see this example here. There's the Pharisee who evaluates himself as being quite righteous. He's doing everything right. He's really trying hard to live a righteous life. And he does not acknowledge that he has any need to make any change in his life. In fact, he sees the need for others to change. But the other, the tax collector, sees his own sin. He knows that he is worthy of punishment in, what he, in the way he lives. And he asks for mercy. And the one who becomes justified in the eyes of God is the one who humbles himself, that tax collector, who acknowledges his failure and knows that he can do a better job, knows that he can change, knows that he wants to change, and gives it over to God. I'm sure that uh, depending upon the circumstances, we may find ourselves in, in one or the other uh, person's shoes. But we need to acknowledge our sin and our failure. Uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 3, and I'll read verses 18 through 20. First Corinthians 3 and verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. These are warnings to us that if we think we are wise, especially with regard to uh, worldly wisdom, or if we think we are perfect in our ways, we deceive ourselves. There are some brilliant people, some smart people in this world, but their opinions, their ideas, their inventions are foolishness to God. They are not going to help them save themselves or anyone else. The report card that these people get who rely on their, their worldly wisdom and their own righteousness, if they don't apply godly wisdom in their lives, they will receive an F. <laughs> and that F, according to this scripture, stands for futile. They're, that worldly wisdom is useless if we are trying to live a truly good life. That's bad news. Turn, uh, staying in 1 Corinthians, turn back a page or two to 1 Corinthians 1, and we'll read verses 26 through 31. We already sung quite a bit of this in our opening hymn today. 1 Corinthians 1 and 26, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put, the to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now this should help us to see ourselves more clearly, that we are imperfect, especially with regard to human measures, strength, and wisdom, and power. It is because we are flawed, that God has chosen us, in fact. That is what it says here. God has chosen the foolish of the world. He's chosen the weak of the world, the base things, <laughs> the ones who are despised in the world. These are the ones that God has chosen. That describes you and I. 
This is a point of humility for us. That is that's the point. But it is also a tool to show the world that humility is the beginning of becoming perfect. We can give God no space to help us learn and grow if we are already perfect in our own eyes or for if we already don't need to change. The matter of the fact is that we need to change. We have to. Because we are sinners who fail on a daily basis. I want to talk a little bit about sin. <clears throat> sin is, uh, as I had mentioned in the opening comments, it is the failure to obey God. And we all do it. Uh, turn with me to James 2, and I'll read verse 10. <clears throat> James 2, and verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law <clears throat> and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. The law of God is complete. It's perfect. You can't take a, a, a thing away from it and retain its perfection. And if we break one part of it, <clears throat> we are guilty of breaking the law. And the penalty of breaking the law is death. It's that simple. We cannot forgive ourselves and receive salvation and forgiveness. It is only Jesus Christ who offers us the way of salvation. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that if we, if we sin just in the littlest way, we are guilty. Plain and simple. <clears throat> Turning over a few pages to 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. <clears throat> this brings home the point that we all sin. <clears throat> First John, chapter 1, and verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Sin is a matter of fact for us. We, it is part of our lives. It is where we fall short. Hopefully we are self-aware enough to acknowledge the areas in our life that need improvement, where we are weak, where we might have sin. If we do, we will be forgiven if we turn away from that sin, if we work to overcome it. Again, we have to give space for God to help us out there. But I'm getting ahead of myself just a little. <clears throat> Going over to Romans 7, and verses 14 through 24. We can read here about Paul reflecting on his sin. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law, uh, with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. If I, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one that uh, who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into the captivity of the law to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? 
Paul so eloquently describes our human nature succinctly in describing the battle between our desire to do good, but the actuality of our behavior. Uh, the will is weak. It is, we can desire to overcome something and, and really work at it, but uh, we fall short. It's, it's hard work to stay consistent, to overcome, and to turn away from sin. But it's a continual requirement that we keep trying. We know what to do if we want to please God. We do. We may even have it in our heart. We better have it in our heart to, to do that. <clears throat> but actually doing it consistently, perfectly, to do it perfectly is impossible. Not of ourselves. We are carnal human beings prone to failure. We all sin. That's the bad news. Let's go over to Mark uh, 14, and I want to read verses 35 through 40. Mark 14 and verse 35, we're reading here about uh, the last uh, hours of the life of Jesus Christ as he and his disciples were in the, the garden of Gethsemane. Mark 14, verse 35, he went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it was possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them sleeping again. <laughs> For their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Oh, boy. You see, I, I thought three-year-olds were hard to get to, um, to listen to, to an instruction. Here, Jesus Christ is having the same trouble with these, these grown men, right? In the hour of Christ's betrayal, Jesus makes a simple request for the disciples to pray for him. Stay awake and pray. Right? But they could not even stay awake to do it. And it left Jesus Christ disappointed in them. If we had been in that situation, what would we have done? Would we have uh, had the same experience? This goes beyond our ability to live without sin and highlights the weakness of human nature to not always have the ability to deliver on our intentions. This is why the word try exists. If we were perfect in our ability to execute our intentions, the word try would not exist. If we never failed, we would only do or do not. We would not try. That's for, uh, never mind. Uh, all right, so I, I think we see the point here, that the, the physical bodies that we have, this is, this is what we have to work with. We're not perfect. We have to try in our lives to do things, not knowing if, that, uh, if we will be successful in every situation because we cannot control every situation. Let's go over to Galatians 5 and uh, we'll read verses 16 through 18. Galatians 5 and verse 16. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Throughout the Bible, we are taught that the carnal nature of man is uh, diametrically opposed with the spiritual nature of God. They're, they're at odds. Uh, the fact that we are flesh and blood cannot be denied. We, we can't escape these bodies that we live in uh, and <laughs> the physical constraints that we live, with, uh, live within. We are made this way. It is a matter of fact. We are carnal, flesh and blood. But still, if we want to please God, we can't rely on what we can do with our physical existence. We have to please him spiritually. We need to have our actions led by the Spirit. That is something we must do. Yet we have to do that. We act in such a way with our bodies, you know, with our, our physical minds. We need to be led by the Spirit. It's a, a constant challenge that, that we face over and over again. Going over to Romans 2, uh, I'll read verses 5 through 8. There we go, Romans 2 and verse 5. Oh. What was I saying about uh, the, um, the weakness of, of the flesh here? I think I definitely have got the wrong scripture there. I'm going to have you go to Romans 8 and verse 5. This is one that we I think we heard in the sermonette. <clears throat> Romans 8 and verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Our state of mind, brethren, needs to transcend our physical nature. It needs to go beyond that. It can't be limited by that. We need to be spiritually minded. But as we have read so far, uh, we cannot escape these physical bodies. We're, we're stuck here working with these feeble tools that we have, but we still have to do our best. As physical creations, we need to have uh, the Spirit of God working within us. We need to be spiritually minded so that we can please God that way. We can't please him physically. We need to please him uh, being spiritually motivated. Our motivation to act has to look on God's instructions, God's spiritual commandments. Because if we don't follow those commandments and act in that way, we can't please God. So that fact that we are carnal and that we are weak in that way is the bad news. That is a handicap, if you will. Another bit of bad news is that we are not righteous. Uh, go ahead and say it that way. Uh, turn with me to Isaiah 64, and I'll read verses 4 through 6. Isaiah 64, beginning in verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you, who acts for the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you and your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. For we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf. All our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. 
We are sinners, and it separates us from God. As hard as we try to be righteous and and do what's right, remember that if we break one sin, we are guilty of all. Our righteous acts, if we have a sin on our uh, record, they are marred by that, that sin that we cannot remove. Our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Our sinful nature still defiles anything good that we might be able to do. There's no doubt that we can be righteous in some ways. Uh, We work to do that. In fact, uh, we're commanded to be obedient and be righteous. But as a whole, (laughs) we are not uh, meeting the, uh, the requirement. There was only one man who did that, and his name is Jesus Christ. Turning over to Revelation 3 and reading verses 17 and 18. Revelation 3 and verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Sounds like bad news to me. (laughs) I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. The description of people that we see here are are those who are self-deceived. They have an attitude expressed that is the most dangerous. It's dangerous because self-deception makes a blind spot in, in life. It causes us to be weak in a way that Uh, makes us think we don't have to change, makes us think that we don't have to do anything differently. And we can't see it ourselves. It takes takes the mind of God to uh, open that up. We have to see things from his perspective and and pray for those, uh, those insights. Even when our intentions are right, when we are trying to do righteous things, if we believe that we don't need to do anything more in our lives than just come to Sabbath services and wait for the return of Jesus Christ and do nothing else, we're, we're in a precarious position. The fact is that we have work to do. If we have the attitude where we have the need of, of nothing, if we're doing okay, I have nothing more to change right now because I don't know what to do. We're not trying hard enough. We need to begin by uh, seeing ourselves as God sees us so that we can learn uh, what we need to change. Yes, the bad news is that we have a lot to work on. Bad news is that we sin. The bad news is that we, that our carnal physical nature works against our goal to please God. The bad news is that even our righteous deeds aren't enough to save ourselves from the penalty of death. Even though we face this sorry state of existence, we cannot let it discourage us. Uh, We all fail, there is no doubt. Uh, We have to choose what to do with that failure, though. Are we going to take that failure and, and just give up on continuing to try because our own efforts are futile? Um, I hope not. Some people have walked away from the church because they, they can't do it. They, they cannot. They see their failures and they just can't try anymore. It's too much. But God knows that. He knows that it is too much. You see, we have to take our failure and do something else. Our job with the failure that we see, these 
This bad news is to learn from it and grow and continue on, deepen our commitment and make space for God to work in our lives. The good news is that God does not want us to give up. The good news is that he wants us to grow. The good news is that he believes in us. He is there to help us succeed. In fact, we have to rely on him to do that. We can't succeed without him. The good news is that he's there to do it for us. Let's go to Romans 8 and read verses 5 through 11. Romans 8, beginning in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on things according to the flesh. Actually, I read quite a bit of that already. Let me skip down to the parts that we have not read yet. So I'll skip down to, I think I read through verse 11. Yeah, I'll begin in verse 10. Romans 8 and verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit, which dwells in you. You see, even though we are handicapped by the confines of our physical existence, God gives us a way to overcome that. God does not expect us to save ourselves. He knows that we can't do it. But he does expect us to transform ourselves to live spiritually. And he gives us the tools to do it. We have the Holy Spirit working in our lives, working within us to do just that. If we are supposed to have the mind of God and transform uh, our minds to be spiritually minded, we have to have the Holy Spirit working in us and guiding us to do that. Jesus Christ and his sacrifice made it possible for that to happen. God allowed his son to fulfill that purpose. It's because he wants us to succeed. That's the good news. Turn with me to 2 Timothy. I'll read from chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. We have to realize we cannot save ourselves. We are not called because of our own good works. We are called according to the purpose that God has in mind for us. He wants us. He has called us not because of our works, but in spite of our works. He knows that we are weak and feeble, that we are not the strong and the wise in this world. He is doing that for a purpose. It is those people who have acknowledged their own weaknesses, who know that they need God, It is those people whom God can work with the most. 
God has had a purpose for us since before time began. He knew us uh, before we existed. He knew we would be right here, that we would go through these struggles and that we would call on him. It's our job to do it. Uh, let's go back to Romans 6 and read verses 20 through 23. All right, Romans 6 and verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in, in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If we don't commit ourselves to living a spiritual life, then we only have death to look forward to. We, we rely on ourselves, and we know that uh, there's only one end. If we don't have the mind of God and the Holy Spirit working within us. Now, people tend, uh, people in the world tend to think that obedience to God, a commitment to righteousness is a burden, an obligation to do acts of will against, okay, uh, sorry, to do acts against our will and our nature. A slavery is, is mentioned here. People, uh, just having gone through all the holidays, they sometimes they ask, you know, isn't it a, how do your children handle that? You know, is, don't you feel bad about that? And I actually ask my children about it and they I'm like, no, it's fine. It's great. In fact, it is great. But the world doesn't see it that way. They see this way of life as a burden. But the only thing we are slaves to, with that way of mind, is, is sin. But instead, if we choose to live in a way that we are willing to obey God, we become willing slaves to him, if you will, but it's not a bad thing. Uh, it is a way of life that we want. And we become free from death. And the best part is that it is a gift as long as we are willing to take it. We've done nothing to deserve it. It is freely given. The good news is that even though we ourselves cannot be righteous, Christ, Jesus Christ, fulfilled that righteous requirement for us. And we can look to him to provide that righteousness in our lives. Let's go over to Philippians 3 and read verses 7 through 9. Philippians 3 and verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Paul makes the statement that any of his good works, any of his righteousness from obeying the law, they are worthless. As we read about in Isaiah, the bad news that our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And he acknowledges that fact too. His righteous deeds that he has been able to achieve, those deeds do not make him righteous. 
He throws that all away to gain Christ instead. All of our righteousness is Jesus Christ's in actual fact. And we have his spirit living and working within us. His righteousness is what we claim in our lives as fulfilling that requirement for obedience to God. Going back to Romans 3, uh, verses 23 through 26. Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We see again the acknowledgement of our sin but also the point that I'm bringing this up at this point in the sermon is that we see the source of justification, the source of righteousness. It is Jesus Christ. God knows that we sin, but he provides us a way to receive forgiveness. He's willing to pass over our sins, as he says here, to those who are willing to allow uh, for the sacrifice to be of Jesus Christ to be claimed in their lives. Uh, going over to Colossians 1, uh, verses 27 through 29. Colossians 1, verse 27. To them, God willed to make known that uh, to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. In order to take advantage of the gift of salvation through the righteousness of Christ working for us, we need to take some action. We can't just sit back and do nothing. We have to do more than just invoke his name. We have to work. We actually have to change our lives and commit to doing, uh, uh, living obediently. To, as is written here, we have to follow Jesus Christ's works, to do what he did. And what is he known for? Obedience, perfect obedience. And that is what we are supposed to try to do. And if we do, we will be perfect, as is mentioned here. We will, we have hope of a glorified existence, a perfect existence in the family of God. Jesus Christ provides us that hope. It is his righteousness that overcomes our shortfalls. <clears throat> Going over to 2 Corinthians and chapter 12, I'll read verses 9 through 10. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When we acknowledge that we are weak, and that we need the help of God, then we give space for him to work within us. 
the only way to succeed is by making room for God to live and inspire our actions, live within us and inspire our actions. Uh, we have to look to him for guidance. If we do, he'll provide it to us. He gives us the way forward. Uh, but we have to make sure that we allow him to, uh, to work in our lives. And we do that by <laughs> being humble, by acknowledging that we need help. When we are weak, then we have God's strength working within us. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. Turn with me there, if you will. First Peter 5 and verse 10. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect establish, strengthen, and settle you. As riddled with failure as we are, God promises to help us overcome those failures. He will strengthen us. As we see here, he plans to go so far as to perfect us. We know that there's a glorified state of being that we will experience as long as we continue on this way of life and as long as we don't give up when we face our failures. And as long as we keep trying, we have to continue acknowledging that we have work to do. The good news is that we have Jesus Christ's righteousness to cover our iniquities. Another point of good news is that God believes in us. Uh, turning to Philippians chapter 1. Uh, actually, I'll just read this for you. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 states this. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If we have our minds opened, if we remain committed to God, the failures that we cannot escape from, they will not affect us. They will not affect us because we have the salvation that comes from Jesus Christ's sacrifice. God is willing to work in your life. He will finish the work in us as long as we don't turn from him. If we turn our back on this way of life, or if we turn our back against uh, trying to overcome the big things or the little things, he's not, <laughs> he's not going to be able to, to work in us. But he has begun that good work. He will finish it. I find it extremely reassuring to know that God believes in us, that he is not going to give up on us. He knows that we have the capacity to succeed in our calling. Uh, he did not call us to fail. He called us because he wants us to understand and believe and follow him. We are his first fruits. It's our time now to overcome and to live a life as an example. Uh, it... <laughs> If he did not believe in us, if he would uh, not finish this work in us, it wouldn't have made sense for him to allow Jesus Christ to be sacrificed. It would, it would be purposeless if he knew that we would fail anyway. He knows that we will fail, but on the small scale. He believes that we will succeed on the grand scale and the bigger purpose. This way of life, this Christian way of life, is so much better than anything that we could live uh, in a merely carnal way. God believes in us. Going to 1 Corinthians 1 and verses 27 through 30. 1 Corinthians 1. 
and verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. I'll bring this up again uh, because all those problems, those shortcomings, those failures that we have actually work for us if we acknowledge them. Those weaknesses invoke our humility. And our humility is a prerequisite for allowing God to work in our lives. Otherwise, the physical strength of man would get the glory. And that's not uh, what God wants. Our glory, the really good stuff in our lives, <laughs> the source is from God and him alone. And he gives it to us freely if we allow it to be uh, in our lives, if we accept it, if we commit to that way of life. Going over to Deuteronomy, given the New Testament quite a workout today, we'll go back to the Old Testament here in Deuteronomy 7, reading verses 6 through 9. He addresses Israel as they are coming out of Egypt. They've come out of Egypt and been out of Egypt for a while, but anyway. Uh, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, For you are holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you. And because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. God speaks to Israel in setting them apart for a holy purpose just as we too are called for a special purpose. And that these people, just as you and I, are not chosen because of anything special in and of themselves. They didn't do anything. We don't do anything to deserve our calling. But it is out of love. And the promise that God made when Abraham expressed his humility and obeyed God. It's that o obedience that God wants to see in our lives. And he is faithful in, uh, in us that we will succeed in fulfilling his purpose of obedience. God is faithful in, uh, in our ability to succeed. <clears throat> Going back to 1 Corinthians 10, and uh, I'll read verse 13. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God believes that we can come out of sin and overcome our challenges overcome our trials. He helps us as well by providing us a way of escape, a way of handling those trials. He's, he's not going to leave us out to dry, again, set us up for, for failure. He, he wants to see us succeed, uh, but it is our, our test to show our willingness to obey, our fortitude in not standing down and running away in the face of trial. Going over to 2 Thessalonians 3, <clears throat> verses 3 through 5. 
2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. God will protect us from Satan when we rely on him to do so. Again, we read that he is faithful that we can do it. God believes in you, that you can do it, that I can do it, that we can do it. That's the good news. Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in uh, my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and do for his good pleasure. We have a calling to salvation, and we have to, ch- we have to choose to do something about it. Uh, but we can have the confidence that our efforts are not in vain. Uh, even though our efforts in uh, being righteous are nothing in themselves, Our efforts show our hearts. We know that God weighs our hearts. He looks at our intents. And he believes in us. He believes that we can do it, that we can obey him. And in addition to just believing in us, he offers us the help that we need in working within our lives so that we can overcome our inherent shortcomings. He has given us the Holy Spirit to do so. It's very encouraging to hear how much he believes in us. Reading from Titus uh, 3 and verses 3 through 8, this really succinctly, in my opinion, wraps up the whole picture. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs, according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. (laughs) Don't give up, is what he's saying here at the end. We have a great hope. It is undeniable that we have a great deal of bad news to deal with in our lives and discouragement. As hard as we try to become the good people that we know we need to be, our efforts will never be enough in themselves. That's the bad news. The good news is that we have God on our side. He's cheering for us. He's in our corner. He provides us with a way of salvation, in fact, fulfilling the requirement of righteousness through the uh, sacrifice of that perfect man, Jesus Christ. The good news is that we are saved. Knowing this, we can carry on with our lives confidently, as Paul implores us here. We continue on our journey to live spiritually, believing that our good works While not enough to justify us, they do serve the purpose to demonstrate our commitment to God, our willingness to obey him. When we commit our lives to God, he is faithful to continue his commitment to our success. Verses 